Thank you, Sanjay. Well, uh, this has been, journey has been sort of a blessing and a curse because all these pumps uh, had a relationship to the heart institute, even the postal pumps. But, uh, but the only work that was done, the continuous flow pumps, which is what we're using today was done here. So the problem with that is now that everybody thinks it's a good idea, which nobody did uh, when I started out, is I have to write all the book chapters. I've got the sixth book chapter I'm writing right now. But uh, anyway, we'll touch on some things here. I'm sure most of you in the audience will give this talk. How does this work? Yeah, punch it, doesn't do anything. <laughs> See? No, no, how did you do that? Yeah, yeah. yeah, you gotta turn it on, yeah. All right, well, everything started, sort of starts with Dr. Nevesi. You can, we always thought he looked a little, uh, a little like Groucho Marx, but let me tell you, he wasn't, he wasn't funny. He was, a, anybody that says they like Dr. Nevesi, you know they never knew him. It's like saying you like Hitler or something. Because nobody was meaner or tougher than Dr. Nevesi. But as I've grown older, I've begun to appreciate him. You, you know, it, uh, he couldn't exist in today's world, you know, firing everybody. He fired uh, out of my year. There were 20 of us started in 1970 and four of us finished. The year ahead of me, there were seven residents. Now, Baylor had room for six. You could have six chief residents in training. So we knew he was going to fire one. I was all the whispering in the halls who he was going to fire. He fired five of them. So there was only two left. Anyway, I think he was a little overly zealous with that, but, but he did uh, do a lot, of, a lot of good things uh, for this field. The, uh, this was a Baylor when he came here, and this is a Texas Medical Center when he came here. And he told me uh, that he came, uh, when he came, he, uh, in 1948, this was 1948, that he heard gunshots and he didn't know what the hell. Uh, and it turned out it was, uh, I don't have a pointer on this, but anyway, he was, um, they were hunting deer. There were still some deer out there. So anyway, it's- uh, I am age ago now, as far as my research work is concerned, is to perfect the artificial heart. Now, this was 1964, but in, starting in 1963, I got involved with uh, Dr. DeBakey on the artificial heart. Not because I was interested in it, because I was a history English major. I wasn't that interested in science. Anyway, it's pretty boring, still is. And uh, the, uh, uh, but everybody had to do a research project at Baylor when I was a medical student. And I, one of my fraternity brothers was in my class, there were just 75 students in the class. And he was one of these guys that was a real gunner. He was always ahead of the, head of the curve. He, and he knew that I never did anything at all until the last minute. And uh, since we started, we had to have, a, the, as freshmen, we had to have a, the title of our research project by November the 1st. And uh, I, I was standing at the uh, elevator over in the Jewish Research Building at Baylor and uh, he, he comes up to me. Frank Polk, and he says, what are you doing for your research paper? And this was October the 30th. And I said, I've got another day. I hadn't thought about it. <laughs> and he said, look, you don't have to do anything. I knew you wouldn't have done anything. 
I'm signed up to do research on the artificial heart with uh, Dr. DeBakey and Domingo Leota, who actually did all the work. And uh, I had to, I had to have another person. I couldn't do it all, so I've already put your name in. All you have to do is show up Tuesday in the lab, and uh, that's how I got in the field. And uh, unfortunately, Frank had a sort of an intentional tremor, and he dropped out after the first year and sort of left me in it for the, all my years as a medical student uh, working on this thing. And I, I remember um, Dr. DeBakey telling me that by 1980, there'd be 100,000 Americans with artificial hearts. Well, this was 1964 probably. Well, it turned out to be a little trickier than just making a postal heart, which is easy. But one that'll last is a little different problem. Let me see. They, uh, most of you know this, but some of you don't. There's always, the, your government doesn't do anything. They send out requests for proposals and have the private companies compete for it. And uh, that's, uh, that's why the, the B-17 is uh, not Bomber 17, it's Boeing 17, because they won the contract. And, uh, but, and, and that's what they started in uh, 63. And Dr. DeBakey was behind this. That was where it was very important. Nobody was doing heart transplants. Nobody thought they were feasible. Somebody was doing some research in it. Leota, as I mentioned, Domingo Leota, who was very important in the early days of this, was doing some work at, uh, in Argentina. And he presented at a meeting at Osayo in 1961. And uh, DeBakey asked him to come here and work on the artificial heart. So that's how they started the project at uh, Baylor. And uh, here's... Uh, one of the reasons we got all the money, of course, was Dr. Vakey was in uh, in LBJ's pocket, and uh, and uh, or maybe the other way around. Here's a you know we always thought Dr. Vakey was either a mutant or product of an alien visitation from Lake Charles, Louisiana. Because nobody could work as hard as he did. He was there all the time. After my arrow. There it is. But you notice, you know, LBJ's head starts here and goes straight. That's like most people, but look at Dr. Bacon. It goes back like a 45 degree angle. It's, uh, it's some sort of alien. But uh, his ears were a little pointed too. But and there's nobody worked harder than he did. He was tireless and uh, he did a lot of good things. Among this, this was actually a lot of money. And that's what, and Baylor did all the meaningful work in it. And because Dr. Vakey got the money and, uh, and that was an important thing. So of course, this is a nice thing. This was, I think 1965 time, and artificial hearts, just right around the corner. <laughs> and we had, look at all these things. That's what uh, Domingo Leota would make these things. Look like, you, you know, you can make them, look like they're for a science, high school hot science project, you know, and just making your garage, because he did, he made them by hand up in the old Baylor lab. This is the way Baylor looked, or the medical center looked when I started here. And uh, it, uh, we, the medical students had to park here and we had to walk all the way over here. Now they park, they've got a parking lot in Fort Bend County somewhere. And they take <laughs> train in, you know, but, uh, but it, you know, as it said, it's, it's, we've had the largest medical center in the world. We were thinking the heart is just a pump. 
And it seemed logical that if uh, that's the main function, you ought to be able to duplicate that. Yeah, it looked pretty easy. But, uh, and it was easy to make a pump, but one that beats 100,000 times every 24 hours in the last 70 years is a little bit more of a challenge. Uh, this, of course, this is when Dr. Cooley came. He was with Blaylock, and uh, who was the premier congenital heart surgeon. He, he never did an open heart surgery in his life, but he did a shunt the blue baby shunt, uh, taking blood from the uh, left arm down to the uh, pulmonary artery. And it, it's still done and it still helps a number of uh, patients. And uh, Cooley was with him when he was doing this. This guy behind him is Al Starr, who made the first heart valve that actually worked. His, uh, Cooley, of course, didn't have much to do with him because he was little short and he's standing on something behind him there to get his head in. But uh, anyway, so Cooley comes here and Cooley has the, the Baylor program. All this is serendipity. Just at, when they started St. Luke's, the, they couldn't afford a children's hospital. There wasn't enough money to pay for a children's hospital, there was no insurance then and da da da. And so they, it, it was part of St. Luke's. And St. Luke's had the Episcopalians and they always had more money than they could spend. So they, uh, it, it, they supported Texas Children's. The key to that though, was that's why Cooley had privileges at Texas Children's which also meant he had privileges at St. Luke's. All the other surgeons at Baylor worked under Dr. DeBakey at Methodist and more or less he controlled them. But Cooley could do a lot of things on his own and nobody knew anything about congenital heart surgery other than Cooley. He went up and visited Lullahy in 19, I don't know if that's wrong, in the fall of 1955. <laughs> I hadn't been through these slides lately. And uh, they saw Lillehy do, uh, he, he did, Lillehy did the first successful heart surgery. They did it with cross circulation. That is, uh, hopefully you, most of you know what that is, but he took the parent of the children because heart surgery then was congenital heart surgery and hooked the parent up to the uh, baby and used the parrot as the heart lung machine. And he got survivors because they had no survivors with open heart surgery after uh, Gibbon did the first successful case in 1953. And that was a, an ASD closure in a, in a girl who was 13 years old. And uh, I think she's still living actually. But the next four he did all died and he never did another case. And in fact, the next 26 cases that were done with a, open, with a heart lung machine all died. So, and, and uh, a lot of those were little highs because they, uh, that's why he started using the parrot as the heart lung machine. And he was the first one to successfully do uh, open heart surgery but he had to have the parent there. And Cooley went up there with uh, Dan McNamara and uh, they came back and he made this heart lung machine. It's up there in our museum now. Uh, we thought we'd, DeBakey had stolen it and Steve Igo found it somehow a few years ago. So we have it, but it's a coffee maker. And that was the first, uh, heart lung machine that was very successful here is, is Cooley used the, uh, you know, normally they had the coffee up in, quit it, what is that? Anyway, this was a coffee, uh, was at the top and it dripped down. So he just put, uh, he put steel wool to, to filter out the air and bubbled oxygen through there. 
And he did the first case in Houston uh, with this in uh, April of 1956. And it was a post infarct BSD, which we still have trouble getting through today. But uh, Cooley somehow got, uh, got the guy through. And, uh, and this of course started out the open heart surgery. And he, he could do it because he did it at St. Luke's. Probably uh, he would have never pulled it off if he had been at Methodist. And so Cooley had the best results in the world. And the reason he had the best results in the world, of course, there's no reason for people to come to Houston, but uh, he, uh, as you can see, was his pump time. It was only always in seconds. And that the bubble oxygenator, which what was all they had then, that was a mortal uh, operation. It was destroyed the blood and that's why everybody died basically with it until Cooley started doing heart surgery. And the, they had these, uh, the, the pump times was always, were, were always in seconds, you know, this one, eight minutes and 40 seconds. I used to have a, a lot of those. He never had a pump time more than 18 minutes. And because of that, he reported 95 cases with nine deaths in 1956. The Mayo Clinic and the University of Minnesota were the only other places doing open heart surgery then. And then the same year, the whole year, they'd done 58 cases with 38 deaths. So if you were gonna have open heart surgery, you tried to get to Houston, you know, and that's what built this place. And, uh, and and I, I went through this already with you. I don't know. And uh, this was one of the animals we were doing. And uh, Frank got in this picture. I didn't know they were coming to take pictures, but he did. So he slipped in on that. But <laughs> but uh, anyway, but the longest animal survivor they had was forty hours. And a lot of it was because, I've already told you that story, let's go on. A lot of it was because the, uh, uh, the Dr. DeBakey, God rest him, did a lot of good things. But if you were in this medical center in the 70s and you needed heart surgery and you knew who was doing it, Dr. Bakey would be the last one you'd choose because he was 52 years old before he even did any heart surgery. And, um, but that was uh, one, of, one of the uh, problems that Dr. Cooley got around again by doing the heart surgery over here and having his own heart lung machine. Now the transplanted hearts were very important because the mechanical device is always f rode on the back of the transplants. And of course, uh, Christian Bernard, who I got to know very well what time, did the first uh, heart transplant in 1967, December of 1967. Whereas Shumway had been working on it for years and years and years. But the problem was they couldn't decide on brain death because death was a legal definition then in the US you had when you lost your pulse. So they had they they knew they couldn't do it unless they had a viable heart. So they had to decide on brain death. And uh, and of course Christian Bernard just did it. And I asked Christian Bernard later when I got to know him in the 80s. And I said, well, how, how did, were you able to do it? And he said, well, you know, in the US they were arguing, they had the Harvard Committee on Brain Deaths. That's the last thing you want is a Harvard Committee on Brain Deaths because they were arguing about it for a year and a half. And, uh, and, and he said they could never decide, but in South Africa, you were dead when your doctor said you were dead. And that was, 
the way he could get a donor. And once he did it, then of course everybody started doing it. And Dr. Cooley did the first uh, successful, here he is with Chris Bernard. He did the first successful heart transplant in the U.S. And uh, Shumway had done two and they died. And uh, Adrian Kanowitz had done uh, one that had died, but Cooley did one, just pulled it out of the air, you know, the luck of the Irish in uh, April of 68. And the guy lived for over a year. This was, of course, this was a difficult scene in Cooley's operating room because he was such a, a, a outstanding surgeon. You can hardly find him in here. But this was, they were having a national meeting in Houston. And of course, everybody was coming to watch uh, Dr. Cooley operate because they had a rule at St. Luke's you could only have three visitors, you know? Well, lots of luck on that. But, and they put a bunch of Petri dishes around to grow the bacteria and show Dr. Cooley how dangerous it was. But none of them grew any bacteria. So he got the last laugh on the nursing administration. Anyway, as I said, Cooley did the first uh, successful one. And more were done in Houston than anywhere else because Dr. DeVakey got in the act uh, uh, because mainly because of Ted Dietrich. And, and uh, so in the first hundred uh, in the world, 26 were done in Houston. And of course, Cooley did the most. Now, Leota became obvious with Leota. It was, I went to Vietnam in 68. And uh, so I was gone during this period. And Dr. Leota knew that Dr. Cooley would never implant one. I mean, I'm sorry, Dr. DeVakey would never implant one. And he was right because it, it took him too long and all the animals died. I remember being over there when he did them and you know, he'd be on the heart lung machine two hours with the animals. So you could put a calf on the heart lung machine two hours a bubble oxygenator, not do anything. They would all die. So it had nothing to do with the pump, but the pump worked well. So Leota started coming over and trying to get Cooley interested in it. We were doing all these heart transplants and, and use it as a bridge to transplant. This is Domingo Leota and the pump this, uh, this, I can't get, the, this is the water valve. And the water valve is why we have the FDA, because it was the first uh, valve that didn't, wasn't a ball valve, so it didn't, it wasn't obstructive. And Dr. Cooley put more of them in than anybody. The problem is after about six months, they started flying out and uh, they realized that, uh, that there was never any animal studies done. And so they added that to the duties of the FDA to approve all the medical devices. There, there was no medical device approval. There was no balloon pump approval. It's never approved by the FDA, et cetera, et cetera. The heart lung machine was never approved. But the water valve is what got us in uh, the problem with the FDA. And they were right, there should have been, if they had done it one calf uh, with this valve, with the hyperdynamic heart, it, it would have flown out in two weeks and you would have known that it would have never worked in patients. But uh, anyway, that's something very few people know because Cooley always wanted to keep it quiet because it started out being the Cooley water valve and then Dr. Cooley got his name off of it. He was sued for $30 million. And uh, he said in the Houston uh, paper that he hoped he didn't lose because he might have to go into a savings account to pay it off. <laughs> Probably the worst thing he could have said, you know. But they finally dropped him. Yeah, but uh, it was the Cutter Company made it and, and they had to declare bankruptcy over it. Anyway, this is the first total heart implant. And uh, this is Haskell Carp who was done. He was a patient that they couldn't wean from bypass and they put the heart in. This is Leo and there's Dr. Cooley. This was the controller, a little, a little bulky. 
but it works actually. The pump worked well, and uh, he, uh, you know, this is a pretty good chest X-ray. He was awake and extubated right after the surgery, and he was talking to them. And when they transplanted him after 72 hours, I think, something like that, the pump looked fine, you know, of course. There was nothing in that period of time, but it was also covered with cells. This was uh, the Dacron, flock Dacron, and that was Dr. DeBakey's idea, probably, although like a lot of things that are, you know, success has many fathers, failure is always a bastard. So uh, it's hard to know whose idea it was, but certainly Dr. Bacon. The possibility has now been established uh, as a reality, the fact that Mr. Carp uh, has regained uh, organ function in terms of cerebral function and kidney function indicates that its mechanical heart is a feasibility. But uh, there's much to be done now. It's, it's much like embarking on the space program. We know that a rocket will go up off of the uh, surface of the Earth, but uh, we haven't set foot on the moon yet. Of course, this was in April of 69, and in uh, July of 69, we did set foot on the moon. But, uh, and of course, he wrote it up and he was uh, good about that. And you notice the absence of Dr. DeBakey's name on this. So it was, and Cooley knew, Dr. DeBakey was very predictable. And he knew that Dr. DeBakey would go through the roof on this. And th the truth is he wanted to get out of Baylor. He wanted to get out from the medical school more than anything else. He, he told me later he, he could survive Dr. DeBakey, but he just couldn't survive the medical school with the biochemistry committee telling him how to do heart surgery and that sort of thing. And uh, I've learned to appreciate that. Anyway, so they had this big fight. He gets fired, Leota gets fired. I was, as I said, I was in Vietnam, much safer place. <laughs> I was in the, an assault helicopter company in Vietnam. I got shot down. Twice they had to, I was in a helicopter that had to auto rotate down, and that's how I ended up getting four back operation. But uh, we were in a combat, it was a, an assault, uh, combat assault uh, helicopter company, and I had to fly on all the combat assaults because my commander, I was the only person in the 350 men. This was 1968, 350 men in an assault helicopter company. And there was only one other that had a college degree. And uh, the rest were mainly poor boys from the South that got drafted. And uh, one other guy got killed uh, after the first two months I was there. And uh, my commander had an 11th grade education. He was always telling me what to do. Clearly, I didn't get along with him very well. But I was in pretty good shape then. My daughter doesn't believe that's me. She thinks I had a, some sort of stand-in. That was one of my medics or something. But, now, Dr. Cooley uh, had no experience with the artificial heart program at all. Didn't do any laboratory work. He was a good surgeon, but that's, that's all. all. Dr. Dr. DeBakey Dr. seemed to show a little interest. Anyway, we've drilled on that enough, but but uh, he was right about Dr. Cooley because what he said initially was that Dr. Cooley didn't care about research. He'd never done any research. He'd never been in an animal lab. He just did things because he was so gifted. He was such a gifted surgeon. And, uh, but, and he wanted to get out of Baylor and he knew Dr. Baker was very predictable. He was firing, him. but he also fired Leona because he was a culprit a co-conspirator in the thing. So Leota leaves and, uh, but so he doesn't have a lab. So Dr. Cooley actually feels guilty about that. And that's how the, the our, our lab got started. And uh, Dr. Cooley, who God rest him, he would never spend a nickel on anything. It didn't matter how much money he made. He made $18 million in 1982. That later came out in the bankruptcy. 
more than more than the Beatles made. But he uh, he wouldn't spend any money for the lamb, so he got the Cullen uh, family, the Cullen Foundation. So our lab is called the Cullen Cardiovascular Research Lab, and that's how our lab got started. It's the only in vivo lab really in the country now, probably in the world, certainly the only one that can do calves. And uh, it, it uh, but this was where it started with this feud. And, and it was important because it showed the feasibility of artificial hearts. There was all sorts of discussion again about this and that. And, uh, but he woke up, he was fine. They should have left him on it but Cooley wanted to get him uh, transplanted as soon as possible, obviously, because they really didn't know what the outcome would be because there, there were no animals survivors. So that was true, but not because of the pump, because the pump worked well. Anyway, that uh, was uh, how we got a, a lab here and how uh, it, it was uh, in all the, all the devices in the world came at from uh, our lab, they're being used in the world today. The transplants failed, as you know, that first era of transplants failed. And that uh, was why they started the, the, the support of the um, LVADs. And, and they were initially supposed to be permanent LVADs. Well, they didn't know what permanent meant. So they decided two years, there was no, doing, there was no heart transplants in this era because they stopped doing them except with Shumway in uh, Stanford. And uh, this was the, uh, an early RFP, but it was, it was to be electrically controlled out, no, nothing penetrates the body, nothing. And we'd, we'd work that out, we can power that we did in the 70s. You don't need uh, a, a drive line to power these things. You can power them transcutaneously. That's as old as Tesla. But, uh, and, what, and we couldn't do it with these postal pumps, not because of the pump, but because of the compliance chamber. We couldn't get a compliance chamber that would last uh, two years. And that was the RFP. It had to last two years. The pump would last two years but not the compliance chamber. So we started just venting it to the outside through a, a drive, through a drive line. It was, you know, it was vented. And we had, we ran the power through that as well. And uh, we had uh, the first patient to ever leave the hospital. Well, it was a patient I did in 91. And uh, very important because this had gone from you know, a huge console to a guy out who was dying of heart failure when we put it in. He's out playing basketball three months after we put it in. So, and I think it was really a very important, Mike Templeton was a patient's name, uh, important step because it shows that you could have an untethered uh, LVAD. And it, all of these LVADs that we worked on were the first ones approved by the FDA. Now, I got interested in continuous flow because I knew these postal pumps would never last more than about two years. The diaphragm would wear out. As I said, the fact that it lasted two years, that's 36 million uh, excursions in a year, that it didn't wear out before that is, was quite an achievement. But we, we, we didn't need a two-year pump because by then we were doing heart transplants. So it would only be a bridge to transplant. And we didn't, just like today, we don't have enough hearts to do transplants. So it wouldn't actually work in improving uh, epidemiologically uh, anything because it was just adding people to the transplant list. And uh, so, and that was one of the things that stimulated me about working on continuous flow pumps. The other was I knew they could be smaller because one of the restrictions of the, of the postal pumps was the size. And, uh, and it, we needed a pump that could be used in children and, and uh, smaller adults, you know, particularly women, usually a little smaller. And uh, 
we did we put very few of those pulsar pumps in women. So we had to develop a smaller, uh, more durable pump. And as I said, these postal pumps all fail and uh, you can't be replacing it every two years. The size and the durability, here the, the size of the pump, you can see was a big barrier. Shumway, who was a, a great power mine down through the years, but he always pointed this out that it had no epidemiologic value so the question was, of course, do we need a pulse? Well, you're, you're required to have a pulse. It never existed outside of any mammal in the world. And uh, you had to have a pulse because the heart had to get blood. And the heart had to get blood. So it had to rest, not for systole. You had to have it for diastole. But I also knew that uh, it, it was something that we, um, if you look at the eye grounds, you see the capillaries and the blood runs continuously at the capillary level. And I knew that, I knew enough about anatomy and biology to know that at the cellular level, you don't need a pulse. Uh, the, um, there was no funding for this and I, paid for it myself, all the animal work through the uh, a transplant research fund that I had because you get paid, believe it or not, $2,500 for taking out the heart just for the transplant, which it's a 10 minute operation, you know? And uh, I was called Probably, I did the first heart transplant here in 82. It was probably about 84, 85. The organ back called and said, we got over $100,000 over there. I said, for what? And they said, for harvesting the heart. And I said, well, that's a nothing operation. You can't get paid for that. And they said, well, everybody else is taking it and we can't keep it here. I'm sure they were trying to. And uh, so I set up the transplant research fund. And so all the hearts that we did, we did more than anybody in the country through the 80s. And um, the, uh, all that money went into the research fund. So that's what funded all the continuous flow research. The NIH uh, was funded the, uh, the uh, postal pumps, spent make millions of dollars, but they spent nothing on the continuous flow pumps. And uh, the... Uh, one of the problems, there were two problems with the continuous flow pump. One was the bearing, because you had to have a bearing. The only thing, pump we had was an actual flow pump. And you couldn't lubricate a bearing in the bloodstream. So Jarvik and I worked on that for over five years. And he did a great, he accomplished a great thing because he finally figured out a way to have a bearing that was blood washed and didn't clot. And they, they've never failed. None of these pumps have failed. Uh, the HeartMate 2 has been in patients 17 years. I thought they would fail, but uh, after five or six years anyway, but they haven't. And that's why we started working on what you call the HeartMate 3. We started working on that in 1994. Nothing new about it, but the hemopump, pump, the other thing, uh, Whopper showed that the idea was that if you had a pump pumping more than 2,500 RPM, it would destroy the blood. So you couldn't use that. Well, Whopper had this hemopump that we worked on in experimental animals and uh, showed that it didn't hemolyze and we put it and it would spin at 25,000 RPM. And that's, that's the impella. You know that as the impella today. But, uh, and we showed both of those things are what made the, uh, uh, the continuous flow pumps uh, possible. And I said they were sort of the basis of all these implantable pumps. The arm two ended up, it's outside the heart, which is a problem. The Jarvik, I told him to put it in the heart and it, actually it's the best pump because of that. But you see these bearings, they just copied Jarvik. And uh, I don't know how Jarvik let them get away with it, but 
they did and and these bearings these little red things they just last indefinitely i don't know how they're still working at 17 years but uh and the good thing about a heart mate too thortech never did anything they never did any original research or anything they were just a business which i guess is important because they made the pump and uh, they made it commercially available, and that, that's what's what people use. And uh, and of course, all the initial pumps were, were done here. But it's one thing to, to remember that I never got along very well with the Thortech guys for some reason or another. And uh, they they uh, so they did some of their original research at Pittsburgh, and in Pittsburgh they, they took the pump that they developed at Pittsburgh. And they wanted to try it out in the Germans first, see if it would work. They, I never did that. I always did them right here. But they put it in uh, 13 patients in Europe. 12 died within two months, within a month, actually. The one, only one that lived, they took the pump out after uh, two weeks. Magda Yacoub had one night, so he clearly didn't need it. But they, then they brought it to me, and they, they had put the Sir titanium that we use on the postal pumps, which which uh, meant that we didn't have to use anticoagulants on the inside of the pump. And I showed them that uh, if they did that, then the pump would clot. And of course, the guys working on it said, well, it didn't clot in the postal pumps. I said, well, but the postal pumps have this huge surface and you've got you know 50 microns of clearance. And that's what why it clotted in the, in the uh, patients in Europe. It didn't in the animals either. The animal has a hyperdynamic heart, the calf particularly. So it shows you the capriciousness of the animal studies and and how something like that was, was just, you know, basic to me anyway. I told him to get rid of the center titanium and I'd put it in a patient and I'll put it in the first HeartMate 2 clinical was in, uh, I'll put it in in November of 2003. Anyway, so well on this, this is a heart rate two patient. He lived five years. He wouldn't, he didn't want a uh, transplant because he was a smart guy. He, the transplant long-term survival has not changed. Not changed, it's not improved the, at all since the 90s. They have a 90% one year survival now because they transplant a lot of people who don't need it. And that's the, the, uh, the government requiring that. And uh, that's a five year, 15 year, 15 year survival is about 15%. 20 year survival is about uh, 5%. Now, because of the Kaplan Meyer, you can uh, make it look a little different. And the Kaplan Meyer, like uh, I've had transplant patients count 35 years, well that counts 35 years. The Kaplan Meyer counts seven, uh, five years surviving. So they, they, they had a camera. Pump's ready to come out. <laughs> we took it out, and uh, after it'd been in five years, and he's been out eight years now. So it is. Uh, that's something that that uh, we need to look at more is recovering. But this was in 2019. There's been over a thousand patients with a HeartMate two uh, out over 10 years, and um, I had a, a patient from Arkansas calling uh, not too long ago, and uh, well, it was two years ago. She was sick as a goat when she came down to Arkansas. She's in her 60s. And I, I, we put a heart rate to it and I sent her back and after two months. I thought she died and I never heard from her again. And she called me in, in uh, 20, I guess, 15 years later. And it was Carol Ann, Carol Ann and uh, I suppose, I guess I shouldn't mention the name, but anyway, Carol Ann, I you know, picked up the phone and, and uh, she said, uh, it was Carol Ann. I said, Carol Ann, I thought you died. 
And she said, well, I thought you died because I never heard <laughs> that. So, but she'd had no cardiology care. They, she was on a, a low dose of anticoagulants and she's, she went 17 years. She broke her hip a few months ago in, uh, in Arkansas and died with complications of that, but the pump they had to cut off because it was still running. So these pumps have not been pumped to failure. Anyway, I just think it's... So one of the things I want to talk to you about, Sanjay has already talked to you about, uh, well, he didn't talk to you about this. This is a pediatric pump I'm working on. And this, uh, we, we got a $4 million R01 grant and I'm the PI on it, although I did none of the grant writing. I'm not gonna do that again, but for some reason they put me as PI and I'm the oldest PI on an R01 grant in NHLBI history. But this is the size of this little pump. We're working on it in our lab up on the ninth floor right now. Uh, 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 Dr. Wang from China, you know, all these smart Chinese. And she, she developed, it was my idea to have a small pump, but I never did any of the engineering. And I'm, as I said, I don't know anything about it. I didn't like it. And, uh, but I told them what we needed. And we need a small pump that we can put in through the uh, subclavian vein, put it into the left atrium and pull it out and uh, unload the heart and that can be done. That'll be done. We'll do that within about two years. But we also need one for children and this could, is also gonna be done for that. We, ha we have a one bearing in this and we're, she's gonna get rid of that bearing with a magnetic suspension. And uh, as I said, this is where we, where we hope we're gonna implant this pump and, and uh, there's no reason why it won't work. You know, again, historically, this was done in the 50s by uh, Clarence Dennis mm -hmm. taking a, a cannula through the internal jugular vein and poking it into the left atrium. And that, and he, and he did eight patients with uh, uh, that. And of course they all died, but it worked, the pump worked. And, this is the way I think this will work and we'll pull the blood out into the subclavian artery. And with this, you can unload the heart easily and put it in a patient that's uh, a, what we call a class three heart failure, symptomatic, but not homebound and not in the ICU, which is the, the pump that we put in now, that's, they should all be that sick before you put it in. But this one you can put in easily and you can take it out easily. It's just, and, uh, and you don't have to open the chest. Now the total heart replacement, uh, again, we, I've got these LVADs finally, but, and most of these LVAD patients don't have a pulse, which is wrong. The reason the lady survived in, in Arkansas so long as it unloaded the heart, you need about a two liter flow to unload the heart. And she still had a pulse, so it was working in parallel. But most of these patients don't even have a pulse. And that's where they get the complications of stroke, the GI bleeding, all that's been described. And, and uh, I wrote it up in 2005, and they should never be without a pulse because that's where you get the complication. Anyway, so uh, this is another reason as I, I said that they're inflow sensitive. That is as the inflow pressure goes up, then the, uh, uh, then the pump pumps more. And that's the, any engineer can tell you that if you, if the inflow pressure goes from five centimeters to 10 centimeters and a pump's flowing at 10,000 RPM, its output will go up to about 14 uh, lead from 10 to 14 liters without changing uh, the pump at all. So it has an automaticity of the Starling's response, 
we started putting this in, we put this in a patient actually, Billy Cohn and I did in uh, 2011. But actually the first one thing we'd done is 2005, we'd done an animal with this and, and uh, it went quite well. There was no pulse at all, as you can see in this, uh, this is a patient actually. And the, the patient that we did woke up and did beautifully. He had a, a sor uh, scler sarcoid of the heart that had already uh, it, uh, metastasized, but we didn't know it when we put these in. Anyway, it worked fine. This is the patient. He actually woke up. He'd been intubated on a heart lung, uh, on a respirator. He started working, he was an engineer. When we realized he had the, the sarcoid in his liver and lung, he cut it off. Now this engineer from, uh, you know, Sanjay's already talked to you about this, but this engineer from Australia contacted me in 2004. We started putting this continuous flow, total artificial heart in in 2004. And uh, I think Sanjay showed you most of this. But uh, it just has one moving part and it's magnetically suspended. So there's no wear at all in the pump, but it has nothing that it touches. And, uh, and as I said, it's unlike what Dr. DeBakey was dealing with in the <coughs> 60s, uh, this is a technology that we just wasn't even available. And you can make it a pulse with it. It's not really a pulse, but it looks like a pulse. And that's all you need for the cardiologists and nurses because they don't like to see a straight line uh, on the arterial lines. But so we, we can make it look like that. But it changes diastole from passive to active. So it does change the physiology uh, a lot. And uh, I think these calves, I hate to operate with these calves, they're the sweetest animals. And uh, they put up with all this. This is a calf on a, um, on a treadmill and uh, it's Parnas and is in the old days. And uh, as you can see this little fellow, we started walking and, and without changing the RPM, the flow goes up just like I told you with, with the increased venous return, the flow goes up to 15 liters. And, and it'll do the same in patients. This is a size comparison to the Abicor heart. The heart in, uh, in, from France is actually bigger than the Abicor. This is a pump that's totally- My major goal now, as far as my research work is concerned, is to perfect the artificial heart. So that was over 50 years ago, and I think we're gonna do it. But, uh, and, and I think we'll have this in patients within a year. I, was, I remember talking to this Irishman, a singer, I had dinner with him one time. And uh, one of the things, he spent a lot of time talking to me about the pump, for some reason he knew about it. And uh, he said the same thing that, you know, uh, he, he thought he was successful because he wrote his own songs. And this was one of the points that I think he, he, uh, we, we decide on, and you can't be creative looking backward. Otherwise, if, if you have a good idea and you tell everybody, all your friends, you've got your idea. And if they all say, well, that's a good idea. It's not a good idea. Somebody would have already done it because every advance that has ever been made in medicine was faced with the whole medical community opposing it. So if you, wait till somebody agrees with you, you'll never get anything done. And uh, try to be creative. All right, thank you very much.